dynamic earth. Whenever you heard the word dynamic in um, ELA, it really means that something changes. So with dynamic earth, it shows that the earth is changing. The earth is constantly changing, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. For our benefit, it's kind of slow. Because if you can imagine right now, if we had plates colliding at a very rapid speed, uh, we would have severe volcanoes, we would have weather pattern changes because of those volcanoes, you would have people who had roads in certain areas, they would be destroyed, it's just kind of crazy. So we're very fortunate that the dynamic part of the earth is very slow, <laughs> okay? So, is the crust moving? Yes. How do we know this? The theory of plate tectonics explains this, and we're gonna get into that. So, evidence of crustal movement? Well, everything originally gets laid down horizontally. Most of rocks that form, they form in these horizontal layers, especially sedimentary rocks mostly. And that's also known as strata. Strata is another word for those horizontal layers. If you ever go to the Grand Canyon or you've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon and you can see that they're horizontal layers that are built up upon each other, that's strata. So there are three types of deformed rocks and the fact that everything lays down horizontally, stuff breaks, okay? So that shows crustal movement of these plate boundaries. So the first one is going to be folded and deformed rock. And that's when you have lateral forces that push things together and it moves things upwards or downwards. So if you look at my lovely foam pieces, these are my favorite. If you look, lateral forces that push together, it either can force it upwards or it can force it downwards. Okay. When it forces it to go upwards, this is known as an anticline. Anticline. This is an arch-like formation. When it goes downwards like this, this is known as a syncline. A syncline has a bowl-like depression. Okay. Anticline. Syncline. Got it? So this is when they're pushed together and it causes folding. Sometimes your anticlines and synclines can work together because there's so much lateral force pushing them together that you have an anticline on this side and a syncline on this side. So draw yourself a picture of before and after. So your before would be horizontal like this and your after would be anticline or syncline, okay? So as you can see the foldedness, this picture is not that great. I think I have another picture that's a little bit better, but you can just barely see right here that there's an anticline in there. Oh, this is a much better. So here is the syncline right here, and this is the anticline going through these rocks, that lateral motion that's pushing them together and causing that strata to be moved. And you can actually see there's a, there's a guy down here to see that this is pretty large. Okay. It kind of looks pretty cool. You'd be able to climb it almost too. And this is another diagram that you can see. The anticline is the part that goes upwards and the syncline is the part that goes downwards. Lateral motion pushing them together. Folding, that's what this is called. Then we have tilted rock. So all tilted rock is, is something usually when you have those lateral forces, it's almost like taking a piece of plastic and pushing it together and that bends and bends and bends until all of a sudden it snaps and it kind of boings itself back to being straight and it's just tilted almost. So that's what happens with this rocks. So it tilts upwards or downwards at an angle because of crustal movement. So your before picture will be horizontal like this again, okay? But then the tilted part of it is it's still going to be horizontal, it's just gonna be twisted at this at an angle. Okay, you can do it either way, it doesn't matter. But basically those lateral forces caused it to not bend nicely like this foam does, but to break and be at like an angle like this, okay? So this is what tilted rock looks like. This is in Northern Costa Rica. You can see the rock strata there, those nice layers that it just must have broken and it's tilted. It juts upwards. 
um, in this area right here, that's where this tilted rock must have happened. All these horizontal layers were laid down on after it, but this must have tilted before all of this happened. Again, this is another picture of what tilt would look like. And then the last one we have is faulted rock. So faulted rock is when you have large cracks that happen in the rock and it causes a fault and the strata can move upwards or downwards. So you can have rocks that are together right here and you can see in our little stream that there's a crack. So then the rock can either go up and move or the rock can go down and move, okay? There's different names for these. You don't need to know the names of how they break. You just need to know that this type of break right here is called a fault. It is a fault, okay? And actually, you can have different sections of your fault. Let's see if I can lift it up. So they go down like this, or the centerpiece can jut itself upwards, okay? This is when I would love to have four hands that I could move upwards and break like that. Okay, so that is a faulted rock. So like I said, you can have a normal fault, which this one shifts down this way. You can have a reverse fault where it goes up here. This is actually a hanging cliff right here. And then you can have a strike slip fault where strike slip is where it slides past each other. It'll slide past each other like that. It kind of happens looking like this underground but on the top of the ground, it looks like this. That's a strike slip, also known as a transform plate boundary, which we'll get into in the next set of notes. Okay, so this is a fault. This is actually several faults. You can see where this line right here and this line right here kind of would have lined up together at some point, but then this must have shifted upwards or this one shifted downwards. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and usually people are in these pictures or they put pens or they put rock hammers or things like that. So you can get a sense of how big or how small some of these features are. This feature is fairly large in terms of seeing where this guy is, that it kind of was pretty big. Sometimes it's even on a bigger scale than that. So another piece of evidence that we've had crustal movement and plate boundaries and plate tectonics are fossils and they are displaced fossils. So the fact that there were marine fossils that are found on the tops of some mountains in some areas proves that that top of that mountain used to be at sea level at some point, okay? So if you want to draw a picture, you can draw a mountain. Let me see if I can get it a mountain. And you can put like a little fishy on the top of it. Okay, that would be pretty good. And then we have benchmarks, so specific elevation markers all over the world that these positions have changed. So if you have ever been out hiking before on the tops of mountains and you reach the summit, usually they have these benchmarkers at the very top and the highest point of the mountains. And it will put the elevation there and it puts the exact latitude and longitude. This one's in Newcomb, New York, and it was taken in 2004. If you were to get the exact latitude and longitude, latitude and longitude pinpoint of this marker and you were to measure it today, it might be slightly different than what it was in 2004. And by slightly, I mean like really, really slightly. However, if we were to measure this benchmark, say a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now, it might not be in the same exact spot that it is now. So we have these benchmarks in order to be able to tell if things are getting larger, if they're getting smaller, if they're moving east, west, north, south, anything like that. That's what these benchmarks are good to help us with. Then we have plate boundaries. Wherever there is a plate boundary in the world, usually there are going to be earthquakes and volcanoes. One plate boundary in the United States is the San Andreas Fault, and that is a transform or a strike slip plate boundary and there are several earthquakes that happen there, okay? So four pieces of evidence of the dynamic earth. We just went over those. Um, isostasy, you really don't need to know that anymore. I don't know why that's still there. And that there are deformed rock formations. So one of my favorite scientists, Alfred Wegener, um, he 
had the idea that the continents must have been moving or must have moved at some point because of all of these pieces of evidence that he found, okay? And he believed the continents had once been joined together and they have slowly drifted apart, but he didn't know how and he couldn't prove how, so nobody believed him. He used to think too that there was Pangaea at one point. Pangaea is the supercontinent and Pangaea is not the only supercontinent that has ever existed in terms of Earth being around. So Pangaea was a supercontinent a long time ago that, that Alfred Wegener believed had happened. So Pangaea was when all the continents had joined together and it broke up about 232 million years ago. And you can actually see how the continents kind of fit together in a puzzle piece. Like South America fits in kind of nicely to where Africa is. And if you look at a map, you can see that pretty well, that those two pieces look like puzzle pieces almost. And there's five pieces of evidence that this must have happened. Our first piece of evidence is that there are fossils on the western coast of Africa and on the eastern coast of South America. They're of the same species. Okay, I have an Ed Puzzle video that you're going to watch and it shows a really cool video of how that works. But basically there were fossils found on those two, two separate continents that are oceans away from each other that they must have been together at some point. So that was the first piece of evidence. The second one is that they compared rock types in different parts of the world. And some different parts of the world that look like they fit together in that puzzle piece, those rock types match up. There's also glacier scars that are running in similar directions across the parts of the world that if, again, if you were to put those puzzle pieces together, those glacier scars run in the correct direction. It's when a glacier, it's basically like a giant ice cube that it has rocks that get stuck underneath the ice cube and when the glacier itself moves, it drags those rocks on top of the bedrock there and it leaves these deep scratches. So that's what glacier scars are. Also that South America, South America and Africa fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, we've already talked about that. And the fact that the plant life and the plant fossils also matched up as well. So it not only was uh, the fossils of marine animals and other animals, but it also was the plant life that matched up as well too. And this picture is pretty cool because it kind of shows you how all that happened. That you have the um, animal fossils and the plant fossils and these other animals. Here's all the where the glacier scars would be, um, the rock types that match up in the areas. And you can see as time went and they separated apart from each other that they must have been at one point together. So did the science, scientific community agree with Wegener at the time? No way, no way. And it's two reasons, because meteorologists believe they're like, well, the weather wasn't the same and the, all these things and that there the were warm species and they didn't believe him. He also couldn't prove it. He couldn't take people down or take pictures under the earth's crust and see that there was something that was moving things around. And Alfred Wegener was kind of a, a risk taker. He went to the Arctic quite a bit. In fact, that's how he died. Um, they got stuck up in Ant or down in Antarctica or he did something and they, 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 he froze to death. So, and he did some other crazy things too in order to survive, but that's for another day. So we have the sea floor spreading piece. This is where new oceanic crust is made at the ridge and it moves outward from the ridge's center. And this helped explain how the continents might drift because they did discover that in certain areas where there was separating and drifting apart, there was molten rock that was coming up in the middle and it was creating new rock and this older rock was starting to get pushed away, pushed away, pushed away, pushed away. So there's three pieces of evidence for that, that there is a mid-ocean ridge and that's the large underwater mountains where there's new sea floor happening at the ridge. There's also this magnetic reversal. So alternating bands of magnetic crystals, they got solidified in the rock. So when there was that new rock coming up in the middle, there were iron filings or magnetic crystals that 
pointed in a certain direction when the magnetic fields were in that direction, and those rocks would travel out farther. However, when the magnetic reversal happened, those magnetic crystals now formed in the opposite direction and solidified in the rock and moved outward as well. So this created these different reversals as you go out from the center of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or the, the Mid-Ocean Ridge. So the liquid iron cools and the iron crystals align toward the north and they kind of flip. So this picture kind of shows you a progression of how that happened. So you have the ocean ridge here and it's separating apart. The reversal happens and they're now going to be pointing in a different direction and the mid-ocean ridge is still going to be separating out. And then it's going to flip again and it's going to still separate. So actually it gets solidified in the rock as it goes along and you can see on this bottom one Okay, this is over a longer period of time. This is now 5 million year old rock that's farthest from the ridge. This is the youngest rock, always in the middle. And then as you get farther away from the center, it gets older, older and colder. And it also, the magnetic reversals kind of help show you that it's like a, it looks like a butterfly. It's the same on this side as the same it is on this side because of when it separates and it's keeping those reversals solidified in the rock, that magnetic reversal. Also because of the age of the sea floor, in that picture I just showed you that the youngest rock is at the center and the oldest rock is farthest away on both sides. It's also hotter at the ridge and it gets colder the farther out you get. So this is the rifting sea floor spreading. You need to draw this in your diagram that you have the convection currents happening in the asthenosphere, okay? And that this mid-ocean ridge, this is where the young warm rock is and it's spreading apart. And as the magnetic reversals happen, that gets solidified in the rock and it's a mirror image from the center going out. Young and hot ridge, old and cold, the farther away that you get, okay? So make sure you draw this in. If you have to pause the video to draw it in, please make sure you're doing that. 